Welcome back to the AI Breakdown Brief, all the AI headline news you need in around five minutes. Today, we are starting with a conversation around data privacy and AI, and there are actually two different and interesting contexts for having this conversation today. The first is a big dust up that started over the weekend around Zoom's terms of service. Over the weekend, people started to notice that there was a big update in section 10.2. Andrew Cote tweets, Zoom updates its terms of service to become the NSA 2.0. I'm in disbelief at this update because of how far sweeping it is, yet here we are. Direct quotes from section 10.2. You consent to Zoom's access, use, collection, creation, modification, distribution, processing, sharing, maintenance, and storage of parentheses, the stuff you say in meetings, for any purpose. You hereby unconditionally and irrevocably assign to Zoom and your end users to unconditionally and irrevocably assign to Zoom all right, title, and interest too, including all proprietary rights. Does this strike anyone else as far-reaching, utterly insane, and totally unethical? There were lots of other people who reacted as well. Eric Toller tweets, canceling the Bellingcat Pro Zoom account and will migrate all our webinars and trainings to a new platform right away. Justine Bateman says, well, not using Zoom again until these overreaching permissions are gone. Now, as it turns out, these terms actually were updated last March. A spokesperson told Vice, Zoom customers decide whether to enable generative AI features and separately whether to share customer content with Zoom for product improvement purposes. A blog post published on Monday sought to further clarify exactly how these terms apply. Basically, what they said is that if you use Zoom's generative AI features, which includes things like transcription as well as chat composition, there is an opt-in setting for admins through which they can allow data from meetings to be used to, quote, improve the performance and accuracy of these AI services. The blog post states clearly, quote, we do not use audio, video, or chat content for training our models without customer consent. And what's more, they actually added a term to the document, just to be super clear, notwithstanding the above, Zoom will not use audio, video, or chat customer content to train our artificial intelligence models without your consent. Regardless of the changes that Zoom would ultimately make, this really struck a nerve. And it struck a nerve because it felt not like something necessarily unique to Zoom, but perhaps the type of thing that lurks in just about every weighty terms of service that we click agree to without even thinking about. LA Times tech columnist Brian Merchant writes, I am very glad to see the revolt against Zoom unfolding as a result of this TOS update, and I hope it inspires us to look harder at all the services we use that generate data for tech companies, which they might use to train their LLMs, or to sell ads or to third-party data brokers. It is obviously an extremely heightened moment right now when it comes to AI and data. And so perhaps unsurprisingly, one of the first cohorts of people to pick up on this Zoom fiasco were a number of folks who are intimately involved with the SAG-AFTRA and WGA strike right now. Now, this wasn't the only context for a discussion about data and data privacy that happened yesterday. OpenAI announced its GPT bot. GPTBot is a web crawler that scrapes data from the entire public internet. As they write, web pages crawled with the GPTBot user agent may potentially be used to improve future models and are filtered to remove sources that require paywall access, are known to gather personally identifiable information, or have text that violates our policies. Allowing GPTBot to access your site can help AI models become more accurate and improve their general capabilities and safety. So there are a few different things to parse out here. First is what the purpose of this bot is. It is designed to crawl the web to get information that can be used for training future OpenAI models. That's the purpose, and they're not trying to hide that at all. Second, OpenAI is drawing some guardrails around what information it will and won't collect. They're saying that it's filtering sites with paywall access, sites that have text that violates our policies, whatever that means, and it's also blocking out sites that are known to gather personally identifiable information. A couple things that stand out from that. One, as with any service... You have to trust that GPT-Bot is actually following the rules that OpenAI is publicly saying. But second, even beyond that, there's just a lot of gray area, right? What is included, for example, in sites that have text that violate OpenAI's policies? Which sites are known to gather personally identifiable information? Where's the list of those sites? How would one go about trying to get additional sites on that? The point here is not to rag on OpenAI, but simply to point out just how much subjectivity, trust, and simple human fallibility there is when it comes to the ingesting of this huge amount of online data. Now, the other interesting piece of this that has generated a lot of discussion is that alongside the announcement of GPT-Bot, OpenAI also shared how people maintaining websites can block access to it. They share a simple line of code that can be used to disallow the GPT-Bot. They also even allow for a customized GPT-Bot access where webmasters can specify some parts of their site that are on limits to GPT-Bot and some parts that are off limits. 
on the one hand, people were enthusiastic that you can actually prevent OpenAI from scraping your website now. On the other hand, some were skeptical about why anyone would allow GPTBot to crawl their websites. AI entrepreneur Mark Tenenholtz writes, Most people don't block Google from crawling. Appearing in search results boosts traffic to your website. Unfortunately, ChatGPT does not, even if it's asked to cite sources. I expect a lot of people to block GPTBot. And of course, the interesting question is, if OpenAI makes it so easy to block access to websites, what is the incentive for anyone to allow access? As that tweet we just read pointed out, there's no quid pro quo as there is with Google indexing. And so wouldn't it become just the default to block GPTBot rather than allow OpenAI access? Is the play simply to bet that people aren't going to take the proactive step of blocking it? It strikes me as a really interesting case study in the evolving space of AI data collection. A couple more on today's brief. Microsoft continues to push ever farther with its AI efforts, announcing that Bing Chat is now coming to mobile browsers. Bing Chat has had Android and iOS apps since late February. However, at the end of last month, they started opening up Bing Chat to Chrome and Safari desktop browsers, and now they're trying to bring it to third-party mobile browsers as well. The announcement was made in a blog post celebrating six months of the new AI-powered Bing. The company said they've seen over 1 billion chats and over 750 images, and that bringing AI-powered Bing to third-party browsers on the web and mobile means is, quote, the next step in the journey allowing Bing to showcase the incredible value of summarized answers, image creation, and more to a broader array of people. They also said that multimodal visual search is coming. This feature, they write, leverages OpenAI models to let you input into chat with images, either a picture you've taken or one you found elsewhere, and prompt Bing Chat with related questions. Bing Chat can understand the context of an image, interpret it, and answer questions about it. For example, you can use visual search to ask Bing Chat about the architecture of a building you've taken a picture of, or take a picture of the contents of your fridge and ask for lunch ideas. It seems everywhere you look these days, we are moving further into the world of multimodality. Lastly today, one to scare us with just how many new types of attacks and scams we're going to have to deal with in this future. A group of British researchers have shared a paper around a homemade deep learning model that can determine what someone is typing simply by listening to their keystrokes and doing so with 95% accuracy. The abstract reads, With recent developments in deep learning, the ubiquity of microphones, and the rise in online services via personal devices, acoustic side channel attacks present a greater threat to keyboards than ever. This paper presents a practical implementation of a state-of-the-art deep learning model in order to classify laptop keystrokes using a smartphone integrated microphone. When trained on keystrokes recorded by a nearby phone, the classifier achieved an accuracy of 95%. When trained on keystrokes recorded using the video conferencing software Zoom, an accuracy of 93% was achieved. Our results prove the practicality of these side channel attacks via off-the-shelf equipment and algorithms. So basically, imagine you were on Zoom, and separately, you scrolled over to your bank's website and typed in your username and your password. With 93% accuracy, the model that these folks developed could actually figure out what your username and password was. Now, even more concerning is that the defensive tactics that are suggested by the researchers aren't particularly encouraging. Their suggestions include using randomized passwords featuring multiple cases. They suggested that if you are ever in a scenario where a recording might be made during a call, that you should add randomly generated fake keystrokes. Lastly, they said just use biometric logins. Gizmodo concludes, I think there's very little likelihood that most people are going to deploy fake typing noises or overhaul their entire typing style just on the offhand chance that it might throw off some sort of acoustic spy lurking nearby. Sure, biometrics are a good idea in general, though it doesn't cancel out the invasive potential that acoustic spying poses generally. I guess the best thing we can do is hope that this is mostly a hypothetical threat and that there aren't too many lunatics out there who would actually try something like this. My friends, that is never a bet that I am interested in making. Anyways, guys, that is going to do it for today's AI Breakdown Brief. Thanks for listening or watching, and I'll be back soon with the main AI Breakdown.